Hello, my name is Mario. Welcome to another system design video. In today's episode, I'm sharing with you how to build and implement protocol buffers with an example in Go and Ruby. In the previous episode, I shared with you the tools that I like to use when working with protocol buffers, specifically Buff and the compiler for generating code in Go. I will be leaving the link in the description so you can check it out. The way I like to categorize the content of a protocol buffer would be five different parts that can be grouped in sections like configuration, data, and behavior. Behavior specifically is the RPC methods that we're going to be implementing and specifically the gRPC implementation. I'm not going to be covering that in particular, but I will be covering that one in the next episode. The configuration section will be things like the package name, the syntax used, and options around that file. Then the data will be things like messages and enumerations. Messages represent data, the actual content of the payload, and their content is declared using fields. Those fields have a type, a name, a number, and in some cases, extra options. Field types consist of things such as your typical uh, types, like in any other language, like floating numbers, integers, bytes, booleans, and strings. One really important thing about those fields is that a parts message uses default values for encoded messages not included in a particular single element. If you're familiar with Go, this will be the equivalent to zero values. So numeric types default to zero, byte types default to empty, bools to false, enums to the value of zero, which you should define, I will be covering that in a few seconds. And if you define message types in, as field types in your message, those will be defaulting to uh, the value that is the, the applicable to the language itself. In some cases, will be like no. Some of the interesting extra options are the support of any field type, a one-off type that groups multiple fields, but only one of them can be set, and maps. As usual, the link to the code will be in the description of this video, so feel free to check it out. I am extending the example that I implemented before, again, in the previous episode, so feel free to look at that video before uh, completing this one. But either way, this is the current user implementation, the current user message. If we look at ba look back at what was just mentioned, I was just mentioning about the field types, we can add new types, new fields that indicate, for example, we want to define a yearly salary. We can be uh, in, on on signed in thirty four. We can call salary. Uh, obviously, have to be the tag number, or rather, the field number should be unique to represent one of the each one of the fields individually. If we want to define a repeated a value like an address, for example, addresses, we need to define this keyword called repeated. And obviously we need to define number four. And more importantly, we need to define the message message address. Address in this case, we can keep it simple. We could be street and another field called uh, city just for now. But obviously you want to include things like maybe a zip code, country and so on and so forth. We do, let me close this file, we do a buff lint, everything should be fine, we do a buff generate. And now if we do a git div to the changes that we have, for example, go user v1, you will notice that now we have a salary, you, you unsign, unsign int 32, and a slice of pointer to address that represents the repeated field. Another cool thing about uh, field types is that you can actually indicate optional types. Now in the context of the optional types in protocol buffers, those indicate nullable types in other programming languages. For example, you want to differentiate between was this set in the first place or the value is the zero value. Now it's a bit tricky depending of what you're trying to do. The recommendation will be not to use optional and I don't know that's funny, but to rather re, uh, think and implement your model your model, your message in a way that this doesn't use the optional type uh, in the first place. So let's say optional is not a required field. We just add an optional field. We find an optional keyboard rather in front of the type to indicate that. So if we run another buff generate. Now the thing that is uh, in, in practice, what happened is that get this a get salary right here that indicates the value. So in the case of go will be if you want to check between the, those these value has a value or does this thing is zero, we need to check if it's a nil value and the value of zero, calling this get salary method. Other programming languages may have uh, uh, methods 
implemented that allow you to define and check if the value exists in the first place. For example, Ruby has in the implementation that is right here. Let me jump into the Ruby example. If I do div Ruby user, you will notice that in the case of this one, again, there is an optional message, uh, or rather, there's an optional salary. If I look at the implementation of the interoperability example, you will notice that if I do put message has salary, it will indicate whether does that have the salary or not. Again, if I go to the examples, interoperability, Ruby, reader, main, you will notice that it doesn't have the value set because if you remember, I didn't regenerate the value uh, that is generated by the writer. There is another concept in protocol buffers called options. Those options do not change the meaning of a declaration, but may affect the way it's handled in a particular context. And they could be top level, message level, or field level. Those options, like I said, could be message level, like the one I have right here for the Go package to indicate what is the package name to be used when generating the code. An example for the message level will be using the, the option deprecated equals true that will be a message level again if we do a buff lint buff generate and we do a get diff you will see what it changed is literally in the context of go it will be adding a comment that says hey do not use this type specifically in the context of ruby it will not do anything because that doesn't exist but depending on the language you will get different outputs depending on the compiler that you're using for generating that code an example of using the option level uh, will be applying an option directly to the field will become use deprecated as well you can set it to true remove this one it so it sort of makes sense uh, so the one we don't want the deprecated message only this option so we do a buff link now it's okay we do a buff generate and if you do the diff you will notice that now instead of being the message the comment on the struct uh, now it's on the field which is right here Again, in Go, it doesn't do too much. It doesn't do a lot, a lot of things, but in some other programming languages, it actually do more. Now, when you want to deprecate something, it means that you don't want the users to use it. If you notice what I have right here, again, let me show you the diff. You will see that the, the type is still exists right here. So salary is still there. But it, if I want to literally remove the field, but keep backwards compatibility, there is a another keyword called reserve and what reserve does it it takes the number of the field that you're indicating this is no longer a value that you should be setting therefore i'm still keeping backwards compatibility but i don't want my code to be using any to make it available anymore for my users so if i do above link you will notice it's okay i do above generate uh, and then i do a git div so you can see you will notice that the salary field is now gone but the context of the generated code uh, rather the binary compatibility is still applicable finally enumerations enumerations represent a predefined list of values when declaring them they look a bit like messages but they are always represented as numbers behind the scenes one key detail to remember is to always define the first field as zero because that one will be used as the default a concrete example would be maybe adding a marital status, so we can call it uh, marital status and marital status. The name, or rather the field number, and for this we obviously need to define an enum called marital status. Scroll up a little bit so you can see. The first one will have to be called marital status on specified. That's the convention and remember the first one should be zero next uh, what i'm missing here is that the convention is to use uppercase oops not that one uh, the convention should be uppercase uh, the uh, the value that we use as the snake case so to keep it simple we can call it a uh, single and merit so this will be two this will be one and now if we do above lint, 
seems to be okay okay both generate we do another both diff you will notice the both diff get diff you will notice that now there is a new tab in go called marital status that happens to be using an intro to and again the fields are there if this is your typical sort of like a way to implement enums in go for ruby if we do ruby instead when you go ruby you will notice that now there is an enum that you can use right here as well so that's it for this episode in the next one i will be covering urpc specifically the rpc the behavior how to implement those in go specifically if you have any questions any comments please let me know as usual take care and stay safe i will talk to you next time see you